schedule. So, um, uh, thank you for taking the time to come here. Uh, as you know, the title of the briefing is The Vow Factor, uh, Marriage, Divorce, uh, and Family, uh, Formation, and Their Effects on Health and Well-Being. Uh, I'm the moderator. My name is Robert Moffitt. I'm a professor of economics and member of the Hopkins Population Center at Johns Hopkins University down the road in Baltimore. Uh, I'm also uh, the past president of the Population Association of America, which is sponsoring this event. I was president last year. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to, to be here to rep represent and begin to kick things off for the PAA. Now, the PAA, the Population Association of America, if you're not familiar with it, it's a professional association. have over 3,000 members. Uh, they're all what we call population scientists which includes a wide variety of different uh, researchers from different disciplines, including demographers, sociologists, economists, uh, all either at academic institutions or at non-academic research institutions, and often in federal governments or sometimes state governments, uh, working on population issues of the kinds we'll be talking about today. Um, the members uh, conduct interdisciplinary research and often very policy-oriented, and I think you'll see some of that today. Uh, we also often receive uh, support, either directly or indirectly, from many different federal agencies, uh, most prominently the National Institute of Health, or NIH, uh, National <coughs> Science Foundation, the Census Bureau, and NCHS, the National Center for Health Statistics. So anyway, today uh, we're trying to illustrate the kind of research we do, do and hopefully uh, illustrate its policy relevance as well. Uh, it's about the American family, and I don't think anyone has to tell anyone that the American family has gone through rapid evolution. Uh, people read it in newspapers, but I think most of us know our own family members uh, and see how things are changing over time with, uh, uh, in many different ways, so that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, it's a long subject of research by uh, population scientists, and the PAA has been prominent in that type of research, uh, studying things like cohabitation, single parenthood, uh, divorce rates, and particularly uh, how it affects children. Uh, a subject of a great interest, also how it may differ between different families of different uh, education levels and income levels, to say the middle class versus uh, families of uh, a, a lower income. Uh, so uh, uh, that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, health will be a part of this as well, health and well-being, so you'll, you'll see all that in government policy. So I should emphasize that the Population Association of America does not take uh, any policy positions itself. Uh, it's a nonpartisan group. The speakers here are not here to advocate for any specific policies or in any positions. If they do express them, they're their own and, and not those of the PAA or any of the other organizations that sponsor this. So very quickly, uh, we have three very distinguished speakers today. Uh, first is uh, Dr. Andrew Churlin, on my immediate left, uh, professor of public policy and sociology. Uh, and happens to be chair of his department, uh, Johns Hopkins University, so he's my colleague, you know, one floor up for in our building. Um, and we're also pleased to have uh, Dr. Lisa Berkman here, uh, who's from Harvard University uh, and a professor of public policy and epidemiology. Uh, she was the uh, 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 2014 to 15 uh, uh, president of the Association of Population Centers and uh, very knowledgeable about all facets of uh, population research, and especially that of older individuals and families, as you'll see. We also have Dr. Elizabeth uh, Peters here, who's the director of the Center for Labor and Human Services Research at the Urban Institute. So she's uh, representative of the types of non-academic uh, uh, research centers for population, of which there are very many in the Urban Institute, and her center is one of the uh, most distinguished in doing very interesting research, which you'll hear about. Uh, your folder should have more information on each of the speakers and their biographies and all the many things they've done. Okay, so uh, moving along, I want to first of all thank a number of people and organizations. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Congresswoman Laura Allard and her staff uh, for this and many other things actually, but for sponsoring this briefing, a very uh, uh, loyal friend of population research. Uh, there are also a number of organizations, which you can see on the slide, of also co-sponsoring the event, uh, including the Alliance for Aging Research, the American Economic Association, American Statistical Association, American Sociological Association, the Consortium of Social Science Associations, or COSA, I'm sure many are familiar with that, the Gerontological Association of America. Uh, you can see the interdisciplinary nature here, economists, sociologists, uh, gerontologists, that, uh, uh, or which uh, PAA represents the Population Reference Bureau, and the Society for Research and Child Development. Uh, all th 
thank, uh, wish to thank them for uh, their contributions. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a teaser here on trends in marriage and divorce and cohabitation uh, to lead into the more in-depth discussions that each of our speakers will uh, present to you. Uh, so uh, uh, let me do that, and you'll see some of the things they'll be talking about. Of course, they'll be talking about much more than uh, this alone. Uh, so first, uh, age of marriage, uh, a, a, a um, uh, variable uh, that uh, population scientists focus on a lot. Not everyone's aware that, that ages of marriage were actually quite uh, high back at the turn of the century. Uh, men and women were married quite late then. They did fall. Uh, I think uh, everyone's probably familiar with the post-war baby boom when the ages really fell a lot. That was in the 1950s. Uh, what's not widely recognized is those ages have been drifting upward uh, for many years, uh, since at least the 1970s, if not the late 1960s. Uh, and you can see how high they are now. Uh, these are the um, uh, uh, ages for men and women separately. Men typically marry later than women, and that gap hasn't changed a whole lot, uh, at least in the last 50 years. But they have been going up a lot, and as I think Professor Churlin will talk about, uh, quite a bit in more length. Uh, that age uh, um, uh, increase in age has been associated with two different kinds of uh, types of uh, women, men and women. Uh, they're uh, more educated, college educated, uh, uh, middle class uh, men and women who are marrying late primarily because uh, the women in particular wish to enter the labor force and establish careers before they get married and start a family. Uh, and at the same time, there's also some less disadvantaged families uh, who are having their births before marriage, non-marital births, as I'll show in the next slide. Uh, and they are also uh, postponing uh, marriage, uh, but not postponing uh, childbearing. So we'll be talking about that much more uh, uh, during the briefing. Um, this uh, more shows more explicitly the latter uh, was mentioned. This graph shows percentage of all births uh, uh, that were uh, to unmarried women, uh, and you can see that while it was quite uh, low back in 1960, about 5%, it steadily uh, increased. It's not a recent phenomenon. This has been going on for quite some time, but it hasn't gone down. It's been going up. Uh, subject of much discussion, both among researchers and, and policymakers and the general public. Uh, now, 40%, <laughs> almost 41% of all births uh, are to unmarried mothers, which is a, a historic high, and uh, and uh, say Professor Churlin will be talking about that quite a bit. Um, now, when we ask, what about the fathers? Uh, what are they doing in this? Uh, Professor Peters will talk quite a bit about fatherhood and what the, what's happening to the men. We always focus on the women and why they're doing this. Uh, this also has created a very large uh, population group of single mothers, uh, particularly low-income single mothers. But single motherhood has been going up. That has a lot of implications for later life outcomes and experiences, particularly if you never get married. Uh, uh, that's some fraction of these uh, uh, mothers. And uh, Professor Berkman will talk particularly about some of the implications of this for older life uh, events, which is also uh, an important facet that not most people are quite uh, aware of or thought about. Um, family change, this just shows uh, really the same thing, which is uh, of the population, what percentage are married at any given point in time, and what percentage are never married, and which period of divorce is separated. And that top big blue area there is the percentage of the population that's married, and you can see uh, that that size of that, 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 that part of the graph has been steadily going down. So the percentage of families who are married uh, has been steadily declining. That's been generated by the two uh, increases in the two lower categories, uh, the percentage of women who are never married and an increase in uh, the divorce rate. So I also think that's quite well known, but a subject of great uh, interest, like I said, both among researchers, to why this happened, and also uh, among policymakers and the general public. Uh, finally, um, Professor Shirley will talk more about this than I, uh, cohabitation, another rising phenomenon. Uh, and let me just say as an aside here, cohabitation is not solely a phenomenon of disadvantaged families. Uh, many middle class families uh, also cohabit. Um, these, these, uh, this graph shows increases in cohabitation. Each of those vertical bars shows a later point in time, but it's broken out by age. And at all ages, cohabitation rates uh, have been going down. Now, this graph shows the percentage uh, of, um, of women who have ever cohabited, not whether they're cohabiting right now, 
And many uh, young women cohabit before they marry, so they eventually do marry. But you also have a few uh, divorced and separated women who decide to cohabit uh, before they remarry. So uh, it's a little bit uh, of both. But the rates have been going up, and you see the, uh, the leftmost uh, a set of four bars there is for the total population, and whereas back in the beginning in 19, uh, 2000, uh, sorry, 1987, uh, the, um, uh, about 33%, about a third of all women had ever cohabited, uh, and by the end of this period, uh, uh, 2010, uh, 60%, almost a doubling of the rates of cohabitation. What are the implications of that? Is that a good thing, bad thing? Uh, uh, how should we think about it is one of the subjects we'll be talking about. Okay, so uh, finally let me uh, just note that those graphs I just showed you are all drawn from data, uh, and those data are supported by many federal agencies, and I just list them here uh, for, uh, to make sure I, I, you're aware of this. The Census Bureau collects a, a wide variety of very important information on all those things I just showed you on marital status, uh, percentage of uh, unmarried births, uh, the American Community Survey's questions on marital history are vital to uh, 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 conducting this kind of research. Uh, the National Science Foundation uh, conducts the panel study of income dynamics, another major source of uh, family formation, uh, data on family formation and change. Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, we always think of them as collecting unemployment rate. Well, it turns out they have some surveys which you get a lot of information on young women's uh, childbearing uh, and uh, their e income and their education and things like that. Um, and then the National Center for Health Statistics, NIH. So I just want to emphasize that uh, if we didn't have this uh, valuable federal data, uh, you wouldn't see those graphs up there. We would know a lot less than we know. Um, okay, so uh, let me just make a couple of uh, housekeeping uh, remarks. We're going to order this by having each speaker uh, talk for a few minutes uh, without questions. Uh, and then at the very end, we will have questions uh, all at the same time, a uh, more efficient way to do it. Uh, I also want to mention that we are videotaping the presentations. Uh, after the presentations are over, we're going to turn off the videotape, <laughs> and uh, you're, we're going to have the Q uh, discussion, open discussion, without that going on. I want to thank the Population Reference Bureau, by the way, for, for videotaping this. And if you're uh, uh, interested, they will be posting the video on their website. So if you have friends who weren't able to come and you go back to them and say that was kind of interesting, tell them to go to the uh, Population Reference Bureau website later and, um, and look at the slides. Okay, so uh, I think you have all the slides in your folder, but let's begin immediately. I'm going to choose Professor Andrew Turley.